Good day everyone, I am Janeline Manlunas, the last reporter from Group 13. I'll be reporting about a final topic which is teaching reading to specific groups of at-risk students. So this report is under the last chapter 18 which is about the individual intervention, research, and practice. In the previous lesson of this chapter dealt with the idea that some students have individual struggles in the mainstream classrooms who needs additional literacy assistance and as well as the different strategies that the trained teachers, volunteers, or peers must do to respond to the needs of those struggling students in reading, such as one-on-one -on -one tutoring, use of peer or cross-age tutors, and also components of successful intervention programs were also outlined under the chapter. And now finally, we are moving on to the last topic of this chapter wherein I'll discuss about teaching reading to students who may be at risk of reading difficulties because of cultural differences, like children whose first language is not English on school entry or who do not belong to the dominant culture serviced by the school system. So I'll try to subdivide the idea accordingly and tackle this one by one. So my report will try to cover these three main points. Um, so first, difficulties cause of cultural differences and group of children who may be at risk of difficulties in reading because they are from the non-dominant indigenous culture. And the third is that group of children who are small but, small but seemingly intractable. So the first one here, we have group of students who are at risk on reading difficulties because of cultural differences. So when we say cultural differences, this includes the language. So children whose first language is not English are at risk of reading difficulties. According to Snow et al. 1998, children from a non-English background should not be thought to read in English until they have achieved a certain level of proficiency in speaking the English language. This is because proficiency in spoken English not only enables children to support subsequent learning about the alphabetic principle through an understanding of the sublexical structure of spoken English words, but also allows them to understand the language and content of the material they are reading. Proficiency in spoken English helps children to support subsequent learning about alphabetic principle through understanding sublexical structure of spoken English words. So when we say sublexical structure of the spoken word, sublexical means or refers to constituent parts of a, of a word. So just like for example, uh, when the children is proficient in speaking, even the simple English language like banana, mango, good morning. So the sublexical structure of those words will be familiar with them and help them learning about alphabetic principle that eventually would enable them to learn how to read as well and be able to understand the language and content of the material they are reading. So, for example, the list of words that we have here are very difficult, for instance, to correctly identify them, even in context or on first exposure, if it is not already in a person's spoken lexicon. Just like, for example, this yacht, architect, honor, and chameleon. So, <clears throat> these words, with a a person first encounter this upon first exposure might read this as yach, architect, honor, or chameleon, and or in whichever whichever ways they would read them, because these words are not on person's lexicon. So this is one of the reasons that we have found 
that non-English speaking children benefit significantly from being included in classrooms that employ both an early interactive text reading program and a structured language program. If, however, these children arrive at a school where reading is also taught in their native tongue, they can be taught reading immediately in their first language, while acquiring oral proficiency in English at the same time. So if these children have already undergone interactive text reading program in the school, like reading aloud a selected text to the whole class, occasionally and selectively posing for conversation, and also include a structured language program like synthetic and analytic instruction and different uh, approaches like teaching phonological awareness, sound symbol association, and the like. And so much better if children before arriving at school were already taught how to read in their native language, then it will be easier for them to read and to have oral proficiency in English at the same time. Moreover, According to uh, the study of Bialystok et al. 2005 found that bilingual children learning to read in both languages were more advanced than monolingual children provided that both use alphabetic script. So when we say bilingual children, those children who are able to use two languages at, languages at the same time while the monolingual children only use one language. So, of course, there is a benefit of uh, being bilingual those bilingual children because those um, two languages use alphabetic script that would help them to enhance their reading skills. And also, um, according to uh, Snow et al., so bilingual children have an edge. Being able to read and write in two languages confers numerous intellectual, cultural, economic, and social benefits and is probably the way of the future. So, of course, uh, those children who are uh, bilingual or used to language have really an edge to uh, intellectual, cultural, economic, and social benefits. So, um, because they can actually uh, code switch their language depending on the situation or to the people whom they are interacting with. So they can understand others' language and would not um, have difficulty in um, socializing other people. And next is, um, now let us move on to the second main idea that um, children who also be at risk of difficulty in reading because they may come from non-dominant indigenous culture. So children from the non-dominant indigenous culture may also be at risk of literacy difficulties if not have been exposed to phono phonological activities which foster effective literacy development. So a study of Tanner et al. examples are uh, Native American children in North America, Maori children in New Zealand, or Aboriginal children in Australia. So they have risk of literacy difficulties upon school entry because they are not yet exposed to preschool phonological activities uh, like um, symbol, sound or symbol um, development, phonological awareness. So according to the study of Tamer et al., um, he experimented so a classroom containing of mixed non-indigenous and Maori pupils. So in the uh, first so group, is a student in control classroom and the other is the experimental group of students. Students in control classroom receive standard whole language literacy instruction. However, for the experimental group of students, the major components of three commercially available packages designed to explicitly teach phonemic awareness, rhyme, and analogy, as well as sounds or symbol translation were incorporated into the classroom program over four school terms. So, so after that, after the thorough um, investigation or testing, so he concluded that there were no differences between the two groups of children at school in three on any literacy measure. But the difference between the two groups is already showed at the end of the second school year was a mean reading age of 14 months in favor of the students who had received the phonologically enhanced classroom program. 
So in addition, of significant interest was the fact that despite initial differences on school entry between Maori sa European children favoring the latter, the gap between the two cultural groups had vanished by the end of year two, so the third school year, in the experimental classrooms, but had widened in the traditional whole language classroom. So well, so this is true. Na no doubt jod nga culturally accommodated instruction promotes student participation. So, so this should be um uh kanang kwan ba suggest sa authorities and other multicultural societies nga in education dapat i accommodate yud sa instruction ang 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 cultural differences para mag promote po siya sa student participation because in every culture, lain-lain og needs ang mga bata in terms of kanang sa ilahang reading capacity bitaw. Because some of the um, groups, like for example, there is a, a Philippines, there are um, non-indigenous uh, groups or culture. Ang mga bata nga kanang wala pa kayo sila na-expose sa mga words. But siguro karon less na lang na sila because we have, because of the advancement of technology nga makadungog na po sila ginagmay og English and uh, familiar gamay sa uh, mga English uh, words because of the advancement of technology. But um, no doubt that culturally accommodated instructions gayod, it will really promote participation of the students. So, Finally, what about that small but seemingly intractable group of children without sensory problems so do not appear to respond to the best efforts of parents at home and teachers in regular and tutorial classrooms. Well, according to Oslon 2004, it is important to understand that there are specific genetic mechanisms that constrain learning rates for reading and related skills. He goes on to say that Bernie et al. 2002 have demonstrated that preschoolers' phoneme identity learning rates are significantly influenced by genes, although as yet only one gene has been tentatively identified that may account for a small percentage of genetically influenced reading disabilities. Some specific reading disabilities are associated with difficulty decoding unfamiliar words and or or difficulty in recognizing real words encountered before. So the very known reading disability to us is that this reading disability dyslexia. So it is regarded as a neurobiological but it is a condition that is genetic in origin. So this means that individual can inherit this condition from a parent and it affects the performance of the neurobiological system. Specifically, the parts of the brain responsible for learning to read. So, the idea that it means uh, it runs with the family. So, there are still a lot of reading disabilities because of genes just like the tattering of words or, or um, pronouncing the words incorrectly. So, those are the reading disabilities that children um, may undergo. So, it is very unfashionable to suggest that reading difficulties may have a genetic origin on the grounds that this explanation may absolve parents and teachers from instructional responsibilities. However, Oslon suggests that, on the contrary, it is important to have such knowledge so that the need for extraordinary uh, um uh, environmental uh, support or intervention and as well as significant uh, more reading practice is recognized and also in order to aviate the otherwise inevitable Matayo effects of uh, such children. Extraordinary environmental interventions includes the um, summer reading camp um, in the community and the like. So and also, significant uh, reading practice is recognized uh, not just at school, but also at home with the parents or the guardians. So, um, with all of this, we can um, obviate uh, the inevitable Mateo effects of such children. Uh, Mateo effects terminology is proposed by Keith Stanovic.
1986 to describe incremental literacy differences that develop between individuals who have advantageous early educational experiences and those who do not. So, so that um, the children will not be left behind in the reading uh, progress because dili man gyud ipapasar ang dili uh, makabalo mo basa dili gyud mag progress in lang grade level so that no one would be left behind nga bata dapat to do and there should be an environmental intervention and um both na sa family or sa community and sa school nga intervention for the progress for the learning progress of the children um that kind of mga children nga na ay um reading disabilities so for the summary this final chapter presented some current research data on individualized early intervention program using both trained teachers, volunteers, and peers. So the components of successful intervention programs were also outlined and a brief section was included on teaching reading to the typical children that teachers will almost certainly find in their regular classrooms at school. So this review of research and practice relevant to individual intervention for a typical students in regular classroom completed the literacy instructional program during the first three critical years of school. Teachers' implementation of effective literacy classroom and intervention practices derived from their pedagogical skills and knowledge of converging research data ensured the best possible environment for all their students who started school eager to learn to read and write. Their literacy fledglings are now ready to fly. So, that's all about my report. Thank you so much for listening. Once again, I am Janeline Mandunas, and God bless us all.